Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Okay, what we're going to do today is we're going to summarize, we're going to conclude our look at why N.T. Wright is wrong on the redemption of creation. That is, unless uh, some of you feel that I, there's a particular aspect of Romans 8, 18 to 23 that I haven't covered that you would like for me to address. Uh, there are things, okay? There literally are things that I haven't addressed, but I feel like I've hit the salient, pertinent, and major points of this great text to sufficiently demonstrate that it's not talking about some end of time, end of human history event in which God recreates material, physical creation. So let's summarize what we have seen in, in our examination of, pardon me, Romans chapter 8. Point number one, we have pointed out that Paul is writing in the midst of, oh, pardon me, the sufferings of Christ. Notice, notice a couple of passages right here in the context that alludes to something, interestingly enough, that most commentators, point number one, either totally ignore, or point number two, they, what I call, moralize it. They take it out of its very, very specific historical context, and they say, oh, well, you know, it's just talking about suffering. Uh, it's talking about heart attack. It's talking about cancer. It's talking about, uh, you know, just horrific events in the normal experience of human life. No, it's not, ladies and gentlemen. Notice Romans chapter 8, verse 17. If you are children, then you are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Now notice, joint heirs, if we suffer with him. Now, this is known as the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ was an eschatological concept. As Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 and following, and now I rejoice in my sufferings uh, in my flesh for you, and I fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the, in the afflictions or the sufferings of Christ. And scholars are perplexed. What in the world did Paul mean? I am filling up in my body, in my flesh, what is lacking in, these, in the sufferings of Christ. Well, Paul's talking about the end times, eschatological suffering to fill up the measure of suffering and the corollary to fill up the measure of sin on the part of the persecutors. That was the last day's concept. Matthew chapter 23, when Jesus is standing in the temple, he told the Jews, your fathers killed the prophets. You garnish their tombs and say, well, you know, if we had been alive back then, we would not have persecuted the prophets. But he said, guess what? You do and you will. Because I'm going to send prophets, wise men, and scribes to you. Some of them you will scourge. Some of them you will crucify. Some of them you will chase from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood of all the righteous shed upon the earth. So, the first century was the time of filling up the measure of suffering and sin. Again, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, as he spoke to that crowd, that hostile crowd, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Of doing what? Killing the prophets. So, in Romans chapter 8, we have set before you the idea of the sufferings of Christ as an eschatological concept that was to take to place in the last days, and Paul posited it for his generation, his time. By the way, Colossians chapter 1 is extremely powerful. When Paul said, I am filling up in my body, in my flesh, the sufferings of Christ, that is in the emphatic mode. Paul said, it's me. I'm the one filling up the measure of suffering for the part of Christ. Point number two, Paul said, I, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, quite literally of this now time, the word time is kairos, and it means the designated time, which means it was the last days, all right? The last days were the appointed time to fill up the measure of suffering and sin. 
N.T. Wright has done a great job. Or really, you, you look at his book, uh, Paul and the Righteousness of God, uh, Jesus and the Victory of God, and he does a great job of pointing out how the Old Testament prophets pointed out in the last days. It shall come to pass, et cetera, et cetera. They always look forward, always look forward. Paul, on the other hand, says the Old Testament prophets' anticipation of the last days becomes Paul's this now time. That's right. And that means that Paul was not looking forward for 2,000 years. I mean, after all, if the Old Testament prophets were looking forward for 600 years, 1,000 years, even 12 or 1,400 years, how could Paul be saying anything significant when he says what the Old Testament prophets foretold in the far-off future is the now time? Oh, wait, but we're still waiting 2,000 years later for the fulfillment of the now time. So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of the now time, the now time, not some future now time, the now time. So Paul is very emphatic in placing the eschatological sufferings for his day, his time, even his personal ministry. But that's not all. Paul said, I reckon this is that the sufferings of this now time, and again, keep in mind, the word time is kairos. And that's an incredibly sig significant word. In my upcoming book, Resurrection Feast Fulfilled, I have an entire study devoted to the examination of the significance of the Greek word kairos, meaning the divinely appointed time. Folks, this is a widely overlooked and significant eschatological word. So again, when Paul speaks of the now time, he is talking about kind of like Jesus in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Matthew 4 and verse 17, when he said the time is fulfilled. You see, that's the concept. The, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom has drawn near. That which was once far off had arrived because it was time for it to arrive. Okay, got to go on. And then Paul says, for the earnest expectation of the, of the spirit uh, of the creation eagerly awaits the redemption or the revealing of the sons of God. I pointed out in one or two of my videos on N.T. Wright, there is an overwhelming sense of expectation, of imminent expectation of fulfillment in Romans 8. Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this now time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed. Now look, many, many scholars and even the New Revised Standard Version of the scriptures and the diaglot and some other translations also properly render it as, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed. Greek word, mellow in the infinitive. But that's not all. Paul says, for the earnest expectation, that's from the Greek word, apokarodikio, which basically means to stand on tiptoe with neck outstretched, and then eagerly awaits is from the Greek word, apekdekomai, which means to expectantly look. In other words, if somebody tells you they're going to be here next week, guess what? On Sunday or Monday, you start looking for them. You don't know the day or the hour that they're going to be there, but you certainly expect it to be next week. Both apokarodikia and epidekomai are words that convey tremendous sense of imminence. Expectation of imminent fulfillment. So when you couple mellow in the infinitive, with apokarodikia, 
with apodecomai, and then you couple that with the fact that Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans together in labor pains until now, in verse 22. You have four concepts, motifs, that demand imminent fulfillment. Notice again, verse 22. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. In Isaiah 66, which foretold the destruction of the temple of A.D. 70. But the Lord spoke of the fact, has a nation ever been born in one day? By the way, it's really interesting that some of the rabbis used to say, in one day, a woman gave birth to 600,000. You know what they were talking about? You're talking about Israel, talking about Moses's wife. Was it Jacobin? Is that right? Hmm. Anyway, giving birth to the nation when they were delivered from Egyptian bondage. That's just kind of the way they thought. But God said, shall a nation be born in one day. And then he asked a rhetorical question in which he said, shall I bring to the time of the birth and not bring forth? By the way, on my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, I wrote a series of articles on Isaiah chapter 66. Just go there in the search bar, type in Isaiah 66, the time of birth or something like that whole series of articles on Isaiah 66. Because, you see, God in Isaiah 66 was saying, you know, when the time of birth, you know, when the, when the time uh, of travailing in labor pains had arrived, will I bring to that time and not bring forth? And yet, most commentators say, oh, you know, whole, all, all of creation, that's the bugs, the slugs, the mosquitoes, the trees, the fish, whatever, groaning in labor, even to this present day, 2022. But God said, will I bring to the time of birth and not bring forth? In other words, you know, when the time of childbirth, otherwise known in scripture as the messianic pains, goes all the way back to Hosea, to Micah, to Isaiah, when the messianic child pain, uh, messianic pangs began, the time of the kingdom, the time of the resurrection, the time of the redemption, the time of the adoption, the time of the redemption of the body had drawn near. And Paul says the whole creation groans in birth pangs until now. Once again, that's Paul's now. It's not 2,000 years later. So that means very quickly. That means that since Paul said the whole creation groans together in, birth, in child pain, uh, birth pains, travail until now, that means that the redemption of the body, I don't care what you think about it, okay? Doesn't matter. When Paul says the whole creation is, is in birth pains until now, that means the redemption of the body was at hand because God would not bring to the time of, of deliverance, would not bring to the time of childbirth and not bring forth. And Paul said they were at the time of childbirth because the whole creation was in the labor pains when he wrote. Pretty definitive in, in, as far as I'm concerned. And then he says, for the whole creation, the whole creation. Well, what is that creation? We spent a good bit of time defining that creation as sentient mankind. It is not. You know, what's interesting, I had some people post in response to my studies on Catissus creation. People that, that would simply say, well, yes, it is bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. They didn't give any proof for it. But look, folks, if you don't prove what you're going to claim, then you haven't proved what you have claimed. Just this morning, I posted on a dispensational uh, Facebook page in response to a guy claiming that the Greek word parousia 
is not a, quote, technical word for the second coming of Christ. Well, I'm not one of those who say that it's a, quote, totally technical, unquote, word. But this individual said, no, it's true that parousia is used nine times to speak of the glorious coming of Christ. It's used of another uh, eight times to speak of his coming to gather the saints. This individual, being a dispensationalist, tries to delineate between the coming of Christ in power and great glory and the coming, i.e., for the rapture. No such distinction exists in the scripture. Well, what's the point? My point was, as I pointed out, look, no matter what your concept of that is, the original poster has admitted that the Greek word parousia is used 17 times to speak of the second coming. Point number two. The original poster has completely overlooked the fact that the New Testament said the parousia was to be in the first century. It was near when James wrote. It was near when Peter wrote. It was near when Revelation was written, etc., etc. One individual simply posted in response, well, this is nothing but heretical preterism. <laughs> now there's an answer for you, right? So I posted back and I said, please demonstrate where my comments are false. Hopefully you do understand that ridicule is not reputation. Some people seem to think that because they can ridicule preterism, somehow that's, that's a little bit of an answer. I'm sorry, it's not. Okay, but to continue... So I've, I've spent a good deal of time demonstrating that the Greek word katissis, although it can, in certain limited passages, limited number of passages, it can refer to the entire created order, Romans chapter 1. No doubt about that. But when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, guess what? None of the apostles went and preached to bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. I'm sorry, it didn't happen. Yet Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. Catissus. Hey, find me a passage that tells us of any of the apostles, any of the early church, going out, talking to the trees, going out and preaching to the fish, or again, preaching to the to bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. They didn't preach to dogs or cats or gerbils or goldfish or whatever. Folks, they talked and they preached to men, mankind. Catissus in Romans, Romans 8, the whole creation that was groaning for redemption, for the manifestation of the sons of God, had nothing to do with material, physical creation at all. But he said, the whole creation groans in, in labor, in futility, had been subjected to futility, not willingly. The word for futility, and we did an investigation of this, it's very critical, is the Greek word metaotis. Metaotis is never, ever, ever used, ladies and gentlemen, never, ever, ever used of trees not growing tall enough or being green enough. It is never used of animals being fast enough, strong enough, ferocious enough, pretty enough. Metaotis has to do with mankind failing to achieve the goal of why they were created. The book of Ecclesiastes uses the Greek word in the Septuagint, obviously, metaiotes, over and over and over again. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So much so that Solomon said, well, you know, I, I indulge my sin or myself, in everything that was to be found under the sun. And I found it to be vanity. Why? Well, because he would conclude in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I've tried this, I've tried that. 
I've done every single thing that my money, my wealth, my power, my influence could bring me. What's the conclusion of it? All of that is vanity. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the totality of man. This is all of man. This is how man reaches his potential. So once again, Metiotes has nothing to do with material creation, mountains not being tall enough, valleys not being deep enough, rivers not being wide enough or pure enough or whatever. No, it has nothing to do with material, physical creation. And Paul said, and this is a verse we didn't cover very much, but that's okay. Paul said that they were eagerly awaiting the adoption. I pointed out for you the word adoption is used back in verse 14. We have not received the spirit of fear again, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We talked about the Abrahamic inheritance. The Abrahamic inheritance was that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's Romans 8. Because the whole creation was groaning, earnestly awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God. And Paul said, you know, we've received the adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And they were awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. And I've shared with you how the word body here is singular. I've shared with you how Paul is talking to the corporate church as it eagerly awaited deliverance from the bondage, the death of being oppressed and persecuted. Now, I'm, I'm, look, I'm well aware. I know very good and well. Most commentators say, oh, there's a redemption of our bodies, plural. And they overlooked the motif and the concept of shame versus glory that was dominant, dominant in the first century. When you had a group of people and yes, when you had an individual, but when you had a group of people that were being downtrodden, that were being oppressed, that were defeated, you know, being persecuted, as in Romans 8, rejoice in that you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ, because if you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ, we shall also be partakers of the glory that shall be, shall be revealed. Downtrodden, defeated, dead. That's the body, not the physical body. Paul is talking about the corporate body of the body of Christ being persecuted and that present active pathemata suffering in Romans 8, 18. I reckon that the sufferings pathemata of this present time, it referred to that suffering, that persecution they were enduring when Paul wrote, And thus, Paul said, they were eagerly awaiting the adoption, to wit, the redemption of the body. Because they knew, they believed, because Paul promised it, that their coming or that their current oppression, their coming persecution, their coming death, or their present death in that state of oppression was about to be reversed. Those who were actively persecuting them, i.e. the Jews, Rome was not persecuting the church when Paul wrote in 57 AD. But just like 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, just like Galatians chapter 4, the persecutors, the Jews, as Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, as it was then in the days of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, as it was then the children of the flesh, i.e. Ishmael, persecuted the children of the promise, i.e. Isaac, even so it is now, Paul said. So therefore, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. That is Hagar and Ishmael, 
Cast out the old covenant. Cast out the old covenant people. Now he's not talking about the righteous remnant, obviously. Why? Why? Why cast Israel out? Because she had become the enemy of God by persecuting the body, just like in Romans chapter 8. The body, the body of Christ, was experiencing the sufferings of Christ. That's Romans 8, 17. But as Paul said, the persecuted were going to get relief from that, and the persecutors were going to have the tables turned. They were going to become the persecuted. It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, the ellipsis, those who are present active troubling you, Paul said. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 and 6. So, Paul is talking about a very real, very contemporary problem of persecution of the body of Christ. And he was promising them as they eagerly expected the about to be revealed glory in which their persecutors would become the persecuted and they would be vindicated. As Paul goes ahead to say in Romans chapter eight, they would be vindicated as the sons of God. And as Revelation chapter 3, 14 says, and starting in verse 9, I know, speaking of the church at Philadelphia, I know that you dwell where the synagogue of Satan is, those who say they are Jews, and they are not because they are liars. And I know that because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I will make them to come down and bow before you and to know that I have loved you. As I've said earlier, this is the vindication of the body of Christ. It is not the vindication of biological bodies. It is the vindication of the body of Christ being persecuted by the Jews. That's what Romans 8 is all about. And thus I conclude that N.T. Wright is wrong to individualize Romans chapter 8 and to ignore or to, or to simply set aside the corporate nature of Romans chapter 8 and the promised vindication and glorification of the church. And that assuredly happened in Paul's now time when God brought to the time of birth and brought forth. That was in AD 70. Thank you so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. You have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you on Monday.